apparently we're having fun. This mic in front of us, I think the Sopranos did something to it. <laughs> Blame the choir for it. <laughs> I apologize. It's always a strange thing when you're trying to inhabit a new dwelling. Maybe you know this, or moving to a new house. And you start to learn where the floors creak at different spots, and the furnace doesn't always work, and you know things don't always go right. But you learn how to inhabit such a place. This actually seems to be a fitting theme for today. Today in the church's calendar, we celebrate what's known as the dedication of a church. In many places, we don't exactly know when our churches were actually consecrated. For those of you who are unfamiliar, all of our churches are actually consecrated and anointed it, and hopefully one day we will actually experience this again in this community. And the ritual is quite profound, actually. It's almost akin to a baptism. Because as the bishop enters into the place, he often marks the name or the Alpha and Omega in the floor and sand. He will then go about and sprinkle water along the walls and everything. They will light incense onto the altar and anoint the altar with oil, and the walls are all anointed with oil. Now, to many, this ritual may seem a little strange. Why would we go through a building and pour oil all over the place? Why would we smoke things up? I know a lot of us don't like a lot of smoke in our houses, do we? (laughs) But in the right, you actually take a, a bowl of incense and you put it right on the altar and the whole sanctuary fills with the scent of incense. The symbolism of this rite is to indicate to us that God has made God's dwelling here with us. Now, some of you participated in a retreat a couple of weeks ago in which we reflected from an architectural point of view of how we see this at work. But I'd like to add probably a more spiritual point of view, a sacramental one at that. How many of you have heard the word sacrament? You're going to get a little lesson from me. And at the end, I'm going to give you a test. Okay? You're all going to be tested, so remember this. Anybody grow up Roman Catholic? The Catholics in the crowd, oh, some of them are going half-half. Uh, the Catholics in the crowd would actually know this quite well. Anglicans and Catholics, we share the sacramental system. A sacrament is simply a visible sign of the invisible reality of God working in among us. And the thing about us Christians following in the way of Jesus is that we're very tangible people. The body is good. Creation is good. And we believe, as our Jewish ancestors do, that creation and all things radiate the beauty and goodness of God. Jesus, being a good Jew, he took natural signs and wonders to further communicate or express God's love for you and I. And so he takes bread, as we shall in a moment, breaks it, and gives it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. It wasn't figurative speech. In fact, if you look at the Greek, the Greek is quite clear. John actually uses the word flesh, sarks. He's quite intense about his meaning here. And the point of it is that God desires to inhabit our world, to fill our world with God's presence. He is. God inhabits. God desires to fill all of creation with God's goodness and presence. Now, the readings we heard today come at very interesting points. 
the unfortunate thing when you read scripture lessons is you don't always get the context. But they're important here. In the first lesson, Jacob is actually in a bit of trouble. He's found himself into some trouble. And so in a sense, he's a refugee. He's fleeing. And on his way, he has this dream in which he finds himself lying down on a stone as his pillow. And behold, he sees this vision, as the English says, of a ladder going up and down of angels ascending and descending. But the key line in that passage, here's this man who's a refugee, a man who's in a point of great difficulty. The key line, everybody goes to the ladder. We all think that's the important part. The important part of the reading is a little phrase that's sitting in there. And God was with him. God was with him. Now that's significant. Because so often in our minds we imagine God as somehow remote, far removed, particularly when we're going through trial and difficulty, right? How many of you felt... Like God has abandoned you at some points in life. I know I have. There's been times in my life, particularly those moments that are really miserable, whether it be health, relationships. It's in those moments that it seems like God somehow vanishes just as a time when you need God to be present with you. However, this lesson and then the gospel lesson try to express to us that no, God is actually with us, particularly in our moments of difficulty. That may not always be present to us upon first reflection. In the gospel, the disciples have just gone through the experience by which they've seen Jesus persecuted and crucified, one of the most brutal forms of Roman punishment of the time. They are crushed because they feel as if Jesus had fooled them. That everything that they went through, everything they heard, was all a lie. But Jesus comes into the room, appears to them. They're all huddled together. They're all up in the upper room. They're terrified. Who wouldn't be? They're all terrified. They're stuck in this room. They've heard rumors that Jesus is risen. But for most of them, they don't believe it. Thomas, as you know, doubts it. And says, unless I touch and feel, I'm not going to believe. But Jesus comes into the room. In their worst moment, in the time where they're feeling dreadful, Jesus comes into the room and is with them. And what does he say to them? Peace be with you. Now Mervyn, see I'm always going to pick on Mervyn because he so happens to be close to the pulpit today. Mervyn, one time with the choir, said something really fascinating. So the choir and I were practicing that dialogue at the Eucharistic prayer in which I would sing, the Lord be with you and also with you. And I sang my part in the choir. Well, they weren't too terribly enthused at the moment. And Mervyn said, think about what you are saying here. The Lord be with you. And also with you. You are giving God's grace and peace, God's presence to another. And that's what Jesus is doing here with his disciples. When he says, peace be with you, he's giving a peace that only God himself can give. And Jesus is aligning himself. He's becoming in solidarity with 
the disciples. He's becoming one with. You and I are also called to be one with. So now we go to the epistle. The epistle tells us, rid yourself of all malice, of all ill feeling, of all poor behavior, but rather embrace love. What the epistle writer is inviting us to do in this is to essentially become like God and to be one with God's people. But in order to do that, you and I have to get over ourselves. We do. We have to go beyond ourselves and start aligning ourselves with God. Notice the second paragraph. He's very clear to root us into God, to say, pray. Commune with God. Because when you commune with God, you become one with God, and then you can become one with other people. With. And that's what we're called here. That we can stand with, walk with, be with people through their joys, their sorrows, their pains, their sufferings. But to do that, we have to be one with God. We have to ground ourselves in God, root ourselves in God. What you and I are doing here is actually serious business, by the way. And I'll conclude with this thought. Annie Dillard, anybody here the author Annie Dillard, by the way? She's a great American author still alive. Uh, She wrote a book called Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. And in the book, she talks about the scene where she's in an Episcopal church, and they're at Eucharist. And she reflects on a moment. She says, you know, if we really took this serious, you and I would be utterly terrified that God would come down from the heavens and wipe us all out. If we really took this serious... It may not be evident to us, but God is with us now. And God is in our midst. And are we willing to acknowledge or to open our eyes and see? Jacob had to have his eyes opened to see God's dwelling with humanity on earth. You and I are given that opportunity to do so now. And God's dwelling can take place in the most remarkable of places. In our case, an auditorium. Sure, we don't have a beautiful, stunning church in which to stand, but I actually think that makes us all that much more beautiful. See, the beauty isn't in the artwork. Don't get me wrong, I love beautiful churches. I love beautiful churches. That's not where the beauty is. The beauty is all of you gathered here. You took time, an hour on a Sunday, to be here and to be one with God and one with each other. Take that serious. We are not acting. We are being. And you and I are coming into the presence of God who yearns and desires to be one with you, to draw you up closely. Much like this icon here that I have on the altar. There's a place for you at the table. The Trinity is calling you forward. But you have to risk a little. You have to be like Jacob, like the disciples, 
Maybe get over yourself a little. And maybe risk and dare to believe and to hope even when all else seems otherwise. Because it's going to be in that moment that God will make God's dwelling with us. Amen.